Commission Ursula von der Leyen and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to speak. And uh, I can see already the Ukrainian Prime Minister to get to the lectern. Let's listen in. Excellencies, your experts, ladies and gentlemen, dear Mr. Federal Chancellor, dear Madam President of European Commission, thank you all so much for this tough day, tough schedule. Uh, I believe and I know that these expert and scientific discussions are very productive, very pragmatic, very fruitful, and we have first impressions, and they are very positive. I hope that during the next days we will have uh, this conclusions of our conference, uh, our meetings, and, we'll have, and we will have very good advices how to continue um, our work after the Lugana conference in sense of recovery of Ukraine. And I think that this conference is logic continuation of Lugana conference and is beginning of our future big job big work uh, for recovery of Ukraine, for modernization of Ukraine, for modernization all of Europe, and maybe for modernization of world in future. So we all together today create our future. For my country in direct sense, our future. Thank you all for this. And uh, I would like to express my biggest appreciation and big gratitude to co-host, co-organizers, Mr. Olaf, Madame Ursula, thank you so much for organization of such a great event. I think that expert, expert level today was very high and very good results will create next steps. Next steps, as for me, should be on the platform for coordination of finances and maybe economical and other coordination platforms. But first of all, today we have a previous agreement to organize a financial coordination platform uh, on the basis of J7, uh, international financial organizations, IMF, uh, European Investment Bank, OECD, other financial organizations, and uh, our partners, uh, which support Ukraine today. As I told, united in support, united in recovery, it's a, one of the main principles uh, which we all approved in Lugano. So, as today uh, Chancellor Scholz noted, uh, we all don't organize something for uh, make it like one's action. We will have continuation of our work. We will have coordination platform. We will have on board United States, European Union, our G7 partners, and all international financial organizations. We understand that we need prioritization, and we uh, discussed this today, that uh, we need uh, support of budget deficit. We need uh, financing of rapid recovery needs uh, and needs assessment. Uh, we need recovery and modernization of Ukraine and find these key issues for uh, modernization for next years and maybe decades, as also Chancellor noted today during his speech. And I think that today's priorities are very natural because today's, during these two weeks, Russians destroy our infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, heating infrastructure, uh, water supply and infrastructure, creating the biggest ever uh, humanitarian catastrophe on the European continent. And to stop this, we need to unite our efforts and we need to uh, create uh, something to resist of uh, these intentions of terrorist country Russia. Uh, we should protect our energy, water supplying, heating. We should find format half very, in very fast way to recover infrastructural objects, and we should find altogether a way how to protect our infrastructure, uh, civilian infrastructure, and critical infrastructure. So it's also very important, and I'm sure that during this conference, experts uh, discuss these issues, and we also will have support and will have concrete decisions from our partners. So once again, uh, for the uh, uh, finishing of my speech, my conclusions, thank you all 
who participate today, who spent this day, who spent weeks for preparation of this conference, for preparation of your conclusion, your advices, uh, to all experts, to all Nobel laureates, to all uh, our partners, to President of Switzerland, to Polish Prime Minister, who are now not with us but participate in this conference, to all our friends and partners. Thank you so much, dear Olaf, dear Ursula, thank you so much. All the best to you. Thank you. And those uh, were the closing words of the Ukrainian you, Prime Minister, Francis Denis Chamel, uh, at the Berlin International Expo Conference on Rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, we will also listen in to the closing remarks of the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and uh, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who will speak shortly. In the meantime, I would like to cross over and bring in uh, our political uh, chief political correspondent, Nina Hase, uh, who is standing by for us. And uh, you've been following uh, this conference all day, Nina, and we heard a very polite Ukrainian prime minister there stressing very, very often we and we, the European continent, uh, that is something that's really stuck out for me. And I'm very curious to hear what you made uh, of his closing remarks. Absolutely, Monica. And in a way, it was almost a contrast to what we've been hearing from the Ukrainian representatives all day long, because while they all uh, thanked the international community and they thanked the German Chancellor in his position as head of the G7, the group of the most industrialized democracies around the world, for organizing this conference and for sending this signal that really the international community is standing by the side of Ukraine, what we did hear from Ukrainian representatives like the finance minister was it's all fine and well to have this international platform to coordinate efforts of recovery of reconstruction but what we do need in ukraine is money in our bank accounts we need it now we can't wait and also the message coming from the ukrainians was don't forget that your security is as much at risk as ours is you may not feel it quite as yet but uh, vladimir putin's um waging a war not just against ukraine he's essentially targeting the entire west now, we're about to, to listen to Ursula von der Leyen and Olaf Scholz shortly. Uh, they already have pledged massive support, Ursula von der Leyen, I think thanks to them, like, uh, for the EU, 18 billion euros a month. Uh, but the European Union uh, is, is struggling itself right now. I mean, even uh, the Ukrainian prime minister mentioned uh, the problems with energy, which... Uh, certainly we can feel in Europe as well. Is this a difficult position for her to be in? Well, definitely the European uh, Union feels very, very committed just because of its geographical position. We are very close to Ukraine here. Kyiv is not very far away from Berlin where I'm standing. So it is very tangible here. And of course, the European Union does have to step up its efforts. It does have to send a very clear commitment to Ukraine that uh, the financing will go on for the next couple of months decades and possibly for an entire generation. That is the message coming from Olaf Scholz here. Now, everybody's saying that uh, Ukraine is a country that is trying to become a European Union member. So in a way, European uh, politicians are trying to send the message to voters as well. If you invest in Ukraine, if you make sure that this is a country that can still be livable, then this is something that we will benefit from as well. But of course, all the politicians here in Europe are extremely under pressure uh, to also produce results because, of course, the consequences of Russia's war on Ukraine are very much felt here in Europe with inflation and with rising energy prices. And of course, I mean, uh, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has been uh, often criticised uh, for his somewhat uh, slow reaction to support Ukraine, certainly in terms of military aid, uh, perhaps also not really taking a strong enough stance against Russia for a while. Now at this conference, he's uh, speaking almost in a personal tone of a generational task. What exactly will be Germany's role in rebuilding Ukraine? 
Now, Germany, of course, as Europe's strongest economy, is a vital player, and also it just so happens to be a fact that Olaf Scholz currently is the head of the G7, which is why he's using this position to rally support internationally for Ukraine, because he says Europe can't do it alone. The U.S. is very much a needed player in this, and there is already quite some doubt here by some Europeans whether the U.S. M will stay interested in Ukraine um, after the midterm elections, for example, with a different government in the White House. So this is something where uh, the situation is such that Olaf Scholz says we need to act now. We need to get other big countries into the boat, so to say. And he is going to use the remaining months in his position as head of the G7 to just uh, drum down this message over and over again that uh, this is something that the international community has to do. And from all countries around the world, he said, we need also the efforts from the uh, from the private sector. Now, the big question is, of course, how are they going to make sure that private investors go into a country where they risk losing everything because of Russian bombs? So there has been a bit of talk here about some insurance scheme that could be thought up, whether uh, to invent something like a war risk insurance mechanism so that private investment gets um, encouraged. Right. On, and that, of course, is also part of this uh, much quoted Marshall Plan, uh, which uh, should be adopted. Uh, we remember that the Marshall Plan, the original one, uh, existed after World War II in order to rebuild uh, Germany again. But that was after the war. Now, this is uh, different this time because this is uh, happening as Russia's aggression is still ongoing. And earlier, you had the chance to talk to uh, the head of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, she didn't seem to be too phased about uh, that problem and, and very keen on supporting Ukraine now. She did indeed, and I was surprised myself that Kristalina Georgieva said that she is convinced that people don't understand that Ukraine is a different topic. It is in, at the heart of Europe, so she doesn't expect solidarity with Ukraine um, to go away anytime soon. And she also said it is something where um, European companies can uh, see the benefits if they invest in this country, then will only grow stronger as a continent. So, Georg um, Mrs. Georgieva told me afterwards as well that she expects the first results, uh, concrete results of today's conference essentially to be published by the end of this year, which would be quite something if you think about all the big egos that are at play. I mean, we are dealing here with some of the highest level players uh, of international financing institutions. We are dealing with the Europeans and the American governments. So this is something where they, of course, need to sit down together and leave all those egos behind and then just agree on the facts, on the priorities. Somebody said on a panel today, we don't need a hundred Marshall plans because all these institutions are creating their own plans for helping Ukraine at the moment. We need one and we need to leave all our egos behind. Right, and Nina, as, uh, as we're talking, we've also had a video message uh, from the Japanese Prime Minister, who is uh, the incoming G7 presidency taking over, uh, and currently speaking, the Indonesian president, who is the pre presidency of the G20, which just shows uh, the international interest in what, from our perspective, is, is pretty uh, European-focused. And there was this talk about the longevity uh, of rebuilding Ukraine, that is a generational task. That's going to be tricky to to keep the interest and to keep people actually being willing to support Ukraine any solutions on that front It is a big concern, which is why Olaf Scholz says we need to start now. We can't wait. Nobody knows just how long this war is going to drag on for. So there is no uh, starting after the war procedure, like with the original Marshall Plan after the Second World War. We need to do everything simultaneously, everything at the same time. Having said that, I spoke to some American representatives here in Berlin, and they said to me that it is also in the interest of the Americans themselves to stay invested in Ukraine, if you will, because they, with all their weapons deliveries, have set up the strongest army now in Europe, so they can use that as well for their own benefits. Would you say uh, that the overall tone of that conference uh, was a clear stance by Western allies against Russia? And I think I will 
probably even have to keep that question for uh, the next time we speak because I can see some uh, activity at the conference, on the conference stage, and I assume that the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, is just being invited uh, to come up to the lectern. Let's just cross over and listen to the original sound. Speak to you soon, Nina. ...with remarks from our two uh, co-hosts. Uh, first up, once again, please help me welcoming back on uh, to the podium uh, uh, none other than the President of the European Commission. President uh, von der Leyen, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, this was an excellent conference and I really thank you for all the contributions, all the wisdom, all the expertise that you brought to the table. Um, the main message of the day for me today is that Ukraine has everything it takes for a successful reconstruction. It has determination, it has a vibrant civil society, many, many friends around the globe who want to support, this was visible today, and an impressively resilient economic base despite this atrocious war. For example, the Ukrainian banking sector or the IT sector. For me, always the level of digitalization, dear Dennis, that you have in Ukraine is impressive. Listen to that. After Estonia, Ukraine is probably the most digitized country in Europe, and that is something. This really allows public services to function despite the war, and this is our daily experience in the Commission. When we work together with you, you have a functioning administration despite a war around you, and this is basically because you are so much digitized. I do not want to reflect anymore uh, on the topics that we have mentioned this morning in the welcome addresses, but allow me to focus on a few takeaways from today's discussion. The first one is give ownership to the locals, creating trust in the reconstruction process. It was interesting for me to hear that the original Marshall Plan was successful because independent experts were embedded into ministries. They ensured transparency over key decisions, and we know money cannot solve everything. You need the right institutions. So scrutiny is not only needed to ensure good governance, but also, and that was interesting for me, to monitor the influence of donors. And Ukraine civil society is well equipped to take over this world. My second... My second uh, takeaway, to tap into the full power of Ukraine's human capital and to accelerate the green and the digital transition, there should be continuity of decentralization because the regions and the municipalities are also economic powerhouses. This decentralization, together with the necessary judicial, judicial and anti-corruption reforms, would of course also facilitate private investment across the country. The third point, reconstruction linked with the dynamic EU accession process can function as a catalyst, as it was said today here, for necessary reforms, and at the same time, and this is certainly true, as a strong motivator to implement these reforms, because there's a goal you want to go to, and therefore you understand why you have to do these reforms. The fourth point, self-explanatory, a new Marshall Plan for Ukraine has to match the European Green Deal. This is the opportunity to leapfrog into a modern, competitive and sustainable economy. I like the fifth point that crossed my way. Donors' coordination should prevail over donors' competition. And the better the reconstruction plan is explained, the easier for donors to contribute. Finally, today, and that's absolutely clear, we saw that we will be in this for a long time. Support fatigue might be a challenge, but one participant brought up an interesting counter-argument. 
It is about the importance of communication. She mentioned that politics cannot and should not be separated from the reconstruction process. Putin's brutality is causing tremendous suffering and destruction in Ukraine. But at the same time, these ruthless deeds are backfiring. People's disgust with Putin is a powerful recruiter for Ukraine's rehabilitation efforts. It fuels the new Marshall Plan. And Dennis, I must say, when I listened to you this morning, I was again really moved and touched by the pictures, the videos you showed us. I mean, this is the reality on the ground you are experiencing every day. But when you see it again, it really touches you. And the way President Zelensky and you are communicating to the public is contributing a lot to keep Ukraine on top of the world's agenda and to mobilize lasting support for your country on the world stage. And Ukraine deserves it. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for your unambiguous and unwa unwavering commitment and support for Ukraine, for the recovery and reconstruction of your country, Prime Minister. And we're going to finish a long day the way we started it, namely with remarks by the German Chancellor, the country that is currently holding the G7 presidency and who helped us put this all together here in Berlin today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Ladies and gentlemen, first let me thank all participants for joining us here today for this important global dialogue in Berlin. My very special thanks to President Zelensky for addressing us this morning and to Prime Minister Schmigal on his, and his colleagues who are here with us today, and most importantly, the people of Ukraine. This has been an international expert conference. President von der Leyen and I sought to bring the best and brightest minds together to discuss with delegations from around the world the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine. I'm happy to see the great interest also from civil society and business as we need all actors for a successful recovery. Participation from all over the world through our live stream shows significant global interest. Today's discussion showed once again that the size of the reconstruction challenge is impressive. The experts' contributions provided proof that the core elements of recovery, reconstruction and modernization are very closely linked with each other. Therefore, we need the guidance by experts and as seen today, to identify solutions to this complex challenge. This conference has confirmed my optimism. I take from the panel discussions that there are not only challenges ahead, but also clear and coherent recommendations and concrete ways to actively create a better future for and with Ukraine. Tonight, we have a better picture on which factors are most important to make the recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine a success for Ukraine, for Europe, and for the international community. The recommendations which the experts have developed over the last weeks voiced today will play a vital role now, while our Ukrainian colleagues will continue to refine their national recovery plan. The recommendations will now inform ongoing international policy discussions. As international community, we will continue to prepare the architecture for a robust and inclusive governance framework to guide our support. As G7 Presidency, we will continue our work on such a governance framework in close coordination with the European Union, international organizations and other partners in the G7 and beyond and, of course, with Ukraine, as we have done throughout our presidency this year. Lugano has been the starting point for the recovery of Ukraine. We have continued this important work today, and we will continue to keep pushing forward on this. 
Let me assure you that also beyond the end of our G7 presidency, Germany will continue to play a strong role to support Ukraine where we can. And we are happy to confirm our offer to host the follow-up Lugano conference in 24. I close this conference by sharing with you my conviction, which you have strengthened today. In light of the latest attacks, now more than ever, the recovery of a peaceful and prosperous Ukraine is our joint endeavor. I'm convinced that we are stronger together. We continue to stand together in supporting Ukraine as long as it takes. And those were the closing remarks by the German Chancellor and host of this conference, Olaf Scholz, the International Expert Conference on Rebuilding Ukraine here in Berlin. Before uh, Olaf Scholz, we heard the closing remarks of the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, and the whole closing uh, started with the words uh, by the Ukrainian Prime Minister, Denis Shmihal. Uh, all of them stressing the necessity to start rebuilding Ukraine now, uh, even though Russian aggression in Ukraine is still taking place. And DW's uh, chief political correspondent, Nina Hase, is standing by for us. She's been following the conference for us all day and also obviously listening to those closing remarks. Uh, uh, the last two, especially of Ursula von der Leyen and Olaf Scholz. Uh, Nina, was there anything surprising, anything you haven't heard from them uh, throughout the day? Well, I was interested uh, to hear that German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that Germany will in fact host the follow-up conference to Lugano in 2024. Now, that does seem to me as though they are beginning to create the framework and they are beginning to create a trajectory on how the recovery efforts need to be coordinated because Lugano was a conference that happened in July this year where in the international community agreed on a couple of priorities, but it was all still very much just political messages and also uh, the, a couple of countries uh, pledged the um, financial sums that they would uh, send to Ukraine. But today it was very much about creating this international um, platform to coordinate those recovery efforts and by announcing that Germany will host this follow-up conference in 2024, Olaf Scholz suggested that yes, we are in fact right on this path of helping Ukraine make the financing sustainable and creating sustainable networks and a platform that can actually send a message to Ukraine, we're there with you for the long run. Right. Uh, and there you already touched upon uh, the timeline with this uh, next conference in Lugano, something that Ursula von der Leyen in her speech also referred to, especially also referring uh, to the potential of support fatigue, because this is going to be a long-term commitment, rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, and there was uh, one sentence she said that really stuck out for me, a very, very strong sentence, uh, that support fatigue could be basically opposed uh, by people's disgust for Putin. Uh, that is a very strong uh, choice of words there. And uh, brings me back to what I asked you before those uh, two closing remarks, namely the significance of this conference taking place now, at this time, the kind of message it might send uh, voluntarily or involuntarily to Moscow. Well, absolutely. This is yet another meeting of very important players worldwide that are calling Vladimir Putin and his uh, attacks on Ukraine terrorist acts. So these are very strong words, but uh, they also unite this group of countries that condemn these actions by, uh, by the Kremlin. And in fact, this is something where they say Vladimir Putin is not hinting at any sort of uh, willingness to stop 
those attacks on Ukraine. And if he's not doing that, then we must continue to support Ukraine and we must be there. We, this unites us. This is why we can't let ourselves be fatigued. We can't grow tired of this because it's simply a risk for, uh, for all of us. He's breaching international law, but he's also threatening the very pillars that all our countries are standing on. Right, a, a very, very strong message there, a strong sense of, of unity. Uh, we got uh, certainly now also during uh, the closing remarks. Uh, before we let you go, Nina, perhaps you could just uh, jog our memory again, because we're not just talking about a long-term commitment, but we're also talking about huge amounts uh, of money required. Uh, I mean, the, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, attended the conference via a video link earlier today where he said for his country to get back on its feet, the international community must cover a $38 billion hole in next year's budget alone. What are we looking at there? Yeah, precisely. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, said today uh, on various pa panels that what is needed now is for the international community to look at the needs that Ukraine has in these three phases. They say Ukraine needs immediate help now. And there the figures vary, of course. They also depend, of course, on Russian attacks. If more uh, infrastructure gets destroyed, the numbers go up. That's as simple as that. But um, people like the IMF's um, head for example, uh, calculate that the needs um, by Ukraine could amount up to $5 billion per month. Um, so this is just direct needs. Then there's the second phase. It's the reconstruction. It's sort of uh, going a bit more into making the economy sustainable again, because they say without a running economy, you don't have tax returns, which is also bad for a country that is trying to survive. And then the third phase is, of course, those reforms and the modernization. They say Ukraine could become a vital player when it comes to making the European Union as such a more a greener economy uh, or an economy field and also investing in, uh, in all the modern technology. When you're reconstructing this country, you can already look into the future. And of course, right. the numbers vary, but that is particularly why all those international experts got together now to uh, try and find out just who can assess them, how and uh, just where they this gets concentrated and then how the money gets dispersed to Ukraine because, of course, that is vital that the money arrives now. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Nina, we've just uh, watched also the uh, European Commission uh, President Ursula von der Leyen behind you leaving uh, the conference hall. So this conference is now really coming to a close. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you very much for your coverage, uh, Nina, DW's uh, Chief Political Correspondent Nina Hase there for us. Thank you so much. German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier has made a surprise visit to the Ukrainian capital. It is the first time that Steinmeier has been to Kiev since the Russian invasion began, invasion began on February the 24th. He's visiting areas heavily damaged in the war and will later meet Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Their talks are expected to focus on military support and repairing destroyed infrastructure before the onset of winter. For eight months, Russia has been waging a brutal war of aggression against Ukraine in violation of international law. It was important for me to send a signal of solidarity to the Ukrainians, especially now in this phase of airstrikes with drones, cruise missiles and rockets. Russia took control of most of the Kherson region in Ukraine's south early in the invasion.